Hi, we're John and Mike, and we're the principals of Hatch Duo. Hatch Duo is an industrial design and product engineering studio, and we primarily work with hardware technology startups. And uh, at the core, Hatch Duo started with myself and Mike. John, can you believe it's been five years? I actually can't believe it. It feels like not that long, but it also feels like it's been forever. Time just flew past us. Very large accomplishment for us. I mean, coming from how we started, I think it was just like the two of us starting in the living rooms in that apartment, and and it's slowly grown to this great organization beyond ourselves, right? John and I, we we met each other at the company of Ubiquity Networks. He came in as an industrial designer. And at the time I was a mechanical engineer, I had no idea what industrial design was until, you know, John kind of schooled me. And that's when I sort of had, had to, I mean, I, I, I was still he apprehensive. He didn't like me when I first I, I was a little company. apprehensive about industrial design. I thought it was just, you know, um, you know, people creating like pretty renderings, which, you know, was fire, but I'll be honest, like I thought, I didn't think those things that you designed were producible, but then again, <laughs> I slowly learned and, and had appreciation for, for industrial design. I reported directly to the CEO. Like, I think it was like my first week there and he's like, hey, why don't you go work with Mike Kim? And I was like, who's Mike Kim? He's like, oh, he's in the San Jose office. He's actually like in the next room. Like pinged him, we just started working together. I could tell it was probably his first time working with an industrial designer. Cause he was just, you could just see his frustration when I was doing like venting patterns and things like that. Working through the friction, you kind of get a good, feel for the two disciplines and the respect on both disciplines and then also on a personal level worked out together ate lunch together and then i think we slowly played pokemon go together yeah and uh, through that we became really good friends yeah i think we, we kind of obsessed over pokemon go yeah. like we would have we would meet up after work even during work <laughs> Uh, go to like the cemetery, the parks. We set up our, our own Pokemon gym and yeah. we defended it through that. We discussed kind of like what were the aspirations for after. What would life be like outside and after you think we for you? Yeah. I would notice John, he would wear different watches. For me, like I don't have a big watch collection, but then John would like, he would have like a wooden watch. He'd have like this MVMT and there was a cork one. What was the other design studio? Did you, did you uh, get that Nixon or Nuka? So I thought this guy had some pretty interesting watches. At the time, Kickstarter was blown up with a bunch of like watch projects. You know, after the idea of starting a watch company, we later realized that a lot of these Kickstarter projects were buying watches on Alibaba and then rebranding with the logos. The suppliers that we were trying to source from, they were trying to sell us those watches, the same watches. We were actually trying to find an ODM who can produce our watch like a design. When we quit our jobs, quote unquote, it was like very stereotypical tech startup journey. Quit our jobs, I moved myself with my wife. My wife was pregnant at the time, right next to Mike. We would meet in the alleyway at night, like once, our wives were sleeping. We've obviously come a really long way from there, but just to think back on those times, I have a lot of fond memories. And even the struggles that we had during that time, it's like pretty fun to like think back on it. For a whole year, we we weren't ready to launch a watch it because we didn't have inventory. So we were working on things like, you know, shooting a campaign video, um, marketing strategies with our marketing director. We were trying to get our factories in China to, to hurry in and, and get us either prototype samples, prototypes. Aggregate really like was the seed to uh, attach to it because we claim that we are a startup for startups because we we went through a lot of those founder struggles. Like we maxed out our credit cards just so we can get inventory for Aggregate. Um, we understand the production struggles, the funding struggles, had great friends help us along the way. We started to understand how companies get started. Let's let's stop this door dashing thing. After we got funded from Aggregate, you would think like, hey, they got funded. There's money now. There was not enough money for the two of us to live in Silicon Valley, especially with a kid on the way. So Mike and I were like, we have to default back to our, our core skills, which was industrial design and mechanical engineering. And do what you gotta do, because I know your wife's pissed at you. My wife's pissed at me too. You go freelance, I'll go freelance, and then you just cover our expenses and we'll still do this aggregate thing, but we just gotta cover our living costs. The little freelance jobs that we get, we, it was like tiny jobs, like five, six thousand dollars at a time. We would keep majority of that for our personal selves and our wives, right? And then we throw a little bit of that back in together into this like joint pot where we would like use to 
fund either you know aggregates website costs or yeah. something like that right like it was really scrappy it kind of all changed when we went to hardware fund right like we went there and then i basically ran into an old friend slash old client of mine who wasn't looking for industrial design this time he was like hey do you know any mechanical engineers and i was like actually yeah, Mike, get over here and uh, made the introduction. And I think like the rest is history. That came at the same time as like another friend who referred business over to us. And we're like, hey, we could actually like start another business out of this. And so we did. How Hatch Duo was born. It wasn't really intentional, I would say. Five years from now, like all of us, that's probably listening. It's like, oh my God. But yeah, we, it was kind of, we were accidental firm owners. Yeah. Um, we did it by necessity because we needed to survive. And it just happened that like, the skills, the people around us that we surrounded ourselves with kind of like elevated to this level. Obviously the design awards, Red Dot, Spark, IDEA. Um, I think we've, we've placed second. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're a design company and you know, what have we produced and all that stuff. And we've certainly done really cool products. It's the fact of like business organization. We actually have full-time staff. Mm -hmm. um, and if anyone's ever like started a company, sure, you can fundraise a bunch of million dollars and you know, like, I don't want to call it any startups names, but like they're still, they still don't turn a profit. But for us, like we were completely bootstrapped. We built this organization around our revenue and very, you know, disciplined margin management. And we were able to, within five years, we have full-time staff with benefits, health benefits, 401ks, 401Ks with matching, yeah. starting from our living rooms. I think that's a pretty huge accomplishment. Yeah. So overall you say like a, a compensation package for our employees, right? Yeah. We get yeah. holidays. Um, we force everyone to take two and a half weeks off. Yeah. Even though we have an unlimited vacation, because some of them work so hard, they just don't do it. People can criticize like a lot of small businesses for like how they do things and stuff. But when you're actually like putting your own money on the line, risking it all, and then you're able to like take care of people, that's very hard to do. Not many design firms can say they they can do is um, operate remotely. Oh yeah. We, we're, we're fully remote um, and, you know, we have a home base office, which is here in Sunnyvale, uh, where we're filming. And, you know, we have personnel in in the Midwest and Pacific Northwest, um, all throughout the Bay Area, in Hawaii, in Thailand, uh, South Southern California. We are a minority owners uh in terms of um you know our ethnicity right like we're we're not the stereotypical what you see in the design world for design firm owners and i think like it is a very competitive space especially in the bay area so like industrial design firms in general it's like hard it's a hard game to play in the united states and uh, furthermore hard in san francisco bay area right like where you have the top 10 firms of the world like residing here and to be able to um, carve a space for ourselves, um, being Asian American, I think that's that's something to be said too, and I don't want to like downplay that. We don't celebrate anything; we just work them. <laughs> just kidding. Um, when budget allows, um, yeah. we, we we fly since we are you know distributed. We fly everyone in, um, everyone from remote locations. Get those mileage points, right? You get the mileage points, and um, but the past, the most recent event was. Uh, the Stranger Things yeah. experience in San Francisco. So we flew everyone in for a few days. Quarterly, we try to get everyone together um, as best we can. With remote work, it is a little tough to kind of have the water cooler bonding and you know just the that you know impromptu hop happy hours. But every time we recruit like a new team member, I think that's always like an exciting thing too. So we always try to like go out to eat and stuff. We have happy hour on Fridays through Zoom for Christmas. We tried this thing called Gold Belly. Um, or sponsored or anything, but uh, it's nice where you can try different dishes uh, and they would send it to you um, by mail. On yeah, dry ice, right? Like you can get Franklin barbecue from Texas. My role has evolved uh, from an individual contributor, more of an organization manager, like all the financial accounting, um, legal, legal contracts, as well as all the engineering projects that come through Hatch Duo's door. I try to manage all that. I do less engineering work now and more client management. You kind of do like engineering leadership too, right? Like you kind of guide the systems and processes. Sometimes when, when there, whenever there's like an overlap between industrial design and mechanical engineering, I, I do get involved there. Yeah. Um, I do less of like the, the actual design work and CAD work. Right. 
like, participate in like brainstorm sessions. Alluding to what Mike was saying, like we did everything. Back in 2018 when we first started, I remember just being always exhausted because I had a little infant that Mike could help me pick care of. We would take client calls, I would do the ID work, I'd do the sketches, the CAD, CMF, everything, prototyping with Mike. We would sell the work as well, we'd go look for clients. And it was pretty exhausting, but it really gave us like the knowledgeable skills so that we could pass and hire the right people to help dissect that. And then they do it better than us. My role has moved from industrial designer, pure industrial designer to now like design leadership. And I think the best description of that is like, I evangelize the firm. We promote it, we get the word out that we exist. And overall, just like the visionary. So I think we have a very cool visionary implementer dynamic. The design and engineering relationship hasn't changed. So before we were, I would design a product, render it, he would then engineer it and get it to manufacturing. In a sense, we're doing that with the company now. We set a lot of visions for like where we want Hash to, to be in position. He'll be like, okay, how do we do it? With how much money? Who do we need? We have great people in the company, like great leaders, and you know, but they'll still have problems here and then they'll come to us and be like, hey, like, what would you do for this? And I'll be like, well, I don't know yet. What do you think? <laughs> right? And we'll kind of talk them through it and we'll coach them through that issue and you know, they'll be able to handle it. Yeah, you know, we wouldn't be able to grow our roles without the people. Something I heard recently, which is learn, earn, and then return. Something we've been doing is returning. Uh, we've been speaking at, at college institutions. Uh, we try to inspire young designers who are about to graduate to become, you know, possibly entrepreneurs of their own. Or uh, this past quarter, I I mentored like a small group of university students at San Jose State University. We also had project events. Volunteering organization, nonprofit that helps young middle school to high school aged children who are people of color, right? Be exposed to engineering, industrial design, and invention. It is generally, and it's gotten a lot better, but it is generally a pretty homogenous world in design at the top. Look at all the American design firms in America, which is and then it was very diverse. If you look at the heads of all the different principles of all the industrial design firms, a lot of them are pretty similar. How do you bring about change? Well, you know, obviously we can do that within our own organization, but then there's programs like Project Invent where we can mentor and expose kids, kids who are like us at one point in time to, to understand design. Really, it just stemmed from us having gone through aggregate. Mike and I are serial entrepreneurs. We have other businesses. We understand business. We understand the struggles that come with being a new founder or a founder trying to raise their first Series A. We say we say that we are startup right because we can really empathize with with our clients and we can we can understand where they're coming from and we can work with them. We can be a little flexible, and it's not just a transaction for us. Start startup. What that means is that I think we also we do understand what the pain points are for some of the clients that we work with. Mm -hmm. In fact, many of the clients that we work with. Yeah. Creative capital is yeah. something that we we coined or kind of came up with. That kind of helped us create a portfolio of our own. So we have a small portfolio of, of um, small investments that we've made. So if you don't have as much cash, and it's a startup and a technology, a deep technology that we believe in, we will sometimes portion what would have been cash and invest in time to um, some of these startups. I think that's been really cool and some of them have done really well. We're just ourselves. I don't think we go out like consciously trying to be like, hey, let's make ourselves differentiated here, here, and here. It's, we are a little untraditional and unconventional. We're, we, we started off as a remote team, right? And we continue to do that. We're never scared of new technologies. So while everyone's like panicking about AI and stuff, like our team's already using it. Yeah. Right. Generally try not to be so traditional about, hey, in the Bay Area, you get this huge stock package and that's the only way you can get good talent. Well, we try to do it in other ways, like, you know, um, flexible time off. Design consultancy culture here, I would say is a little different in terms of we're not always pulling all nighters. Yeah, I think like Hash to itself has a personality of its own, right? We're a lot more approachable, we're friendly, uh, we're kind of more down earth. Yeah. You see us on um, in the media, in, in, <coughs> in social media, and on YouTube. And I think this is just, this is how we are. We talk to everyone. Like, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, a well funded startup or, you know, you're a sole entrepreneur or an inventor. Like, you know, if you have an idea, you can come talk to us. We have a very humble size studio and we don't try to like, you know, do the whole bells and whistles thing. We put a lot of that back into our staff instead. We will address things that we see. So for instance, like I don't believe in, uh, we value time here, right? Uh, it goes back to our values, we value time here. We don't 
think that making our people stay up, you know, night after night, you know, um, doing all nighters is really conducive to the culture we want here. Yeah. And good work. Right? So. But there are, there are times where we have to pull all nighters. Um, yeah. That's not to say we don't do it at all. We right. we do, but there's a time and a place for it. Right. We go to CES, the, one of the biggest conventions. For that. Make sure you go and. Uh, Click the little CS playlist and you can see a little bit of what we discovered in terms of trends and technology. Everything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we encourage our, our team to read a lot and to like go on blogs and blogs and um, you know, I always tell the ID team like they should be digesting interesting and inspiring content and reading up on trends and technology. We practice what we preach. So I try to read a lot every day about um, different technologies and trends and the keyword is trends, right? Like it's important to distinguish between things that are just fast fashion mm -hmm. versus lasting and impactful technology. Robin Helton, I think is a, a really notable project. One of the earlier projects that John and I worked on personally, um, probably, probably the last project I think that he and I worked on. There's no staff. <laughs> with no staff, no <laughs> staff member. It was just the literal duo. It was just, yeah, there's a duo. Um, I think that was a memorable one. Um, you can see the background behind this, uh, all the different iterations that we've gone through and um, that final iteration at the very bottom right, it's still what's in production today. Yeah. And we've gotten projects, augmented reality, mixed reality glasses because of third iGen. Mm -hmm. Rise is another one. Um, we've, we've gotten other drone projects through prospects knowing about Rise. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> from tech. From tech, man. <laughs> like, Oh man, I remember that story. Like April's like, okay guys, I got one for you. I don't know if you guys are gonna get mad at me, but uh, can we talk? Like, and I was like, just type it out on Slack. She's like, no, we need to, we need to like talk in person. So we like got on a call, and she's like, so I have this like uh, smart <laughs> project. It's really cool. It's like a data company, um, you know, and uh, it's just, it's with this really cool CEO who is like a doctor, and um, there's a lot of research behind it. And we're like, cool, let's do it. We're excited to take it on, and we kind of thought about it. Like, man, is this gonna like give us some bad press or like taboo press. But ultimately, I think that was like one of the coolest projects. The the solution that we ended up yeah. doing for it, it was like this patentable thing. And I think recently at CES, it won like a, a Innovation Runner Up Award. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the, the memories that came along with it, right? Like we had visitors come in during that project. Oh my and God. And the, the product wasn't displayed, but the, um, the apparatus for testing that product was on display attached to one of our whiteboards. Some clients came to visit and we're like, and here's the workroom. And then they go in and there's a big <laughs> on the whiteboard. The coolest thing is you, you zoom out and you're like, hey, we're getting paid to do this. It was hard process wise. So firm tech, again, uh, because of the subject matter, uh, very intimate subject matter, right? And like, how do you do user research with that in a in a way where you avoid sexual harassment and all these HR land violations, violence, right? And um, Flick is uh, one of our more conservative team members yeah. who definitely, like, he doesn't find it funny. Like, when we first got there, he's like, oh my God, like, how am I going to do this? <laughs> and I was like, hey, you're going to have to find a method of research um, to, like, validate some of the prototypes and things in a way where, you know, people feel comfortable and you're actually getting accurate information. So I think navigating the user testing of that was very kind of a first. From an engineering perspective, Rise was pretty challenging. Yeah. Um, most notably, I think the the propeller guards, because not only did it have to function, it had to meet a specific payload. Yeah. Um, we had to get it as light as possible, but also look iconic. If you look at it closely, it sort of has this lattice structure mm -hmm. that resembles a like the inner of a bone marrow or the inner innards, if you look under bone under a microscope, yeah. kind of has that skeletal yeah. um, porous structure. Mm -hmm. That's sort of how we designed it. We used grasshopper um, and computational design mm -hmm. to do that and uh, came up with iterations and we'd plug it, plug it in and then you guys would plug it into the weight. And yeah. like, no, that doesn't work. Put, do it again. Yeah. Send it to you guys. No, it didn't work. Okay, do it again. Yeah. Oh, look, this one works. Yeah. And then we would prototype it and sure enough, like, after several trials, like it would eventually fly. But I think to Mike's point, like that project was very challenging because it had to look good. It had to be usable. It had to function. It had to fly, right? Like, like if you can imagine, like uh, if you're just designing a desktop item, like the challenges have its own, but you don't have to make that thing defy gravity. If the propellers were in a certain frequency yeah. um, or speed, 
then it would cause uh, resonance or vibration yep. throughout the entire drone. Yeah. It's just managing that particular frequency. A lot of engineering challenges to maintain the design intent, but we did win a we did win a red dot for that. We did. So, yeah. yeah. As AI machine learning evolves, um, we I think that I think we both think that if if you don't adopt it or start using it, you'll be left behind. Yeah. What's already in place currently is that we do augment our firm with a lot of automation and um, you know every aspect of our business is, is augmented in some way. I'm encouraging all parts and facets of our business to really embrace that. You know, we're, we're slowly carving our, our space, we're getting, we're getting um, the fun projects, we're getting um, deep tech stuff, which um, expansion-wise we have very, in, very detailed plans for expansion, which don't want to give too much away. Ashdo is stealthily expanding in many areas and branches of our business. In the next five years, you'll see you'll see more technological advancement projects coming from us. Um, things that you haven't seen before. Um, we're, that's not going to change, and because that part's not going to change, I think you're going to see you're going to always see us at the forefront of, of new. I think the one product that we want to work on for Hatchdo is a robotic project of some sort, whether it's a lawnmower, a window you know, high-rise window cleaner, um, or even maybe an electric boat or electric amphibious vehicle. It's, it's new and exciting and very few companies are doing it. Churn is part of the journey and churn is just like design iteration. You can always charge more. Yeah. I would say get a mentor, talk to people who are in the industry, get a coach who can guide you. Otherwise you're gonna be learning and even probably failing and you know doing a lot of reading and a lot of trial and error if you're okay with that um be sure to have the proper uh, finances to, to back yourself don't have a selfish mindset because that will always fail like if you're just so worried about what you're going to get paid as an entrepreneur you'll never be able to grow a team and um yeah you'll never be able to, to really scale i would also advise that if you do want to get into this business you better be prepared to compete against us yeah don't overthink it. Like I just do it and it's okay if you make mistakes and that's all I got for me. We have annual goals that break down to quarterly goals. So each year before year end, uh, we set goals for ourselves for the next year and we break those goals down by each quarter, what we will want to achieve. And so far we've hit, I think we maybe missed like maybe 20% of them that tend to carry over to the next year. Mm -hmm. We've exceeded the main ones. To make it to five, that's already a feat within itself. Um, to get to the amount of revenue that we've gotten to, um, and profit margin that we've gone to, I think is very hard to do uh, within the first five years. On the design awards level, I would still, I would still like to like get our name in there. And I feel like people are just starting to recognize us. We're kind of like the new kids on the block, so even though we've been around for five years, get our, our name out there a little more, be included in some of those conversations. The outcome that you want is proportionate to the sacrifices you have to make. So what everyone sees right now, the, the external success of Patch Deal, I will say there are a lot of sacrifices that had to be made in order to get to this point. Entrepreneurship's just not for the faint of heart. So if you're gonna do it and do it well, you better be ready to like sacrifice um, to get what you want. I think you know, sacrifice is uh, a key word there, um, and being a, being fluid. I think, like if if plans don't work out or what you plan don't work out, you have to be ready to pivot. I think constantly having a growth mindset, um, immerse yourself in. I mean, read. I think read like just just consuming knowledge. Knowledge yeah. um, is a big part of it. So I'd say. You know, read as much as you can. Yeah, your firm's growth is proportionate to your the founder's growth too, right? So if we just said, "Hey, we're just going to be really good industrial designers and mechanical engineers," and we didn't try to learn about expertise in business and finance and things like that, I don't think we would have gotten hatched to where it is today. Yeah. So and so yeah. Lastly, I just want to thank you for joining us and listening. Uh, I'd like to also thank my partner Mike. I couldn't have gotten to this point with Adam, I mean, there's, again, like, just briefly, we were door dashing at one point, so, and now we're here, so, couldn't have done it without him. Um, the team as well, like, the great people, 
um, who have stuck with us along the way and who have joined us now too. Um, we just really couldn't uh, have, have gotten here without you. And uh, yeah, my family as well. Uh, my, fam my family really supported me through this journey, especially like my wife um, who stuck it through in those really hard times. Uh, and yeah, and so we're just really blessed to be here. Yeah, um, likewise, like, you know, John, he's, he's kind of like my, I mean, John, my business partner, obviously, um, I can't thank him enough. Like he not only pushes me, pushes our team um, to work hard and excel. Um, but yeah, like if it wasn't for John, I think, you know, this, this organization probably would, would fall would fall to the ground. I want to thank all of our clients, obviously, that have um, supported us, believed in us. You know, my family and my obviously my wife who has supported me through the years. We we, we both support each other. She also has a business, so um, she really understands what, what it's like to, to operate a business and to sort of live at work. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. So one thing I'm really excited about is well we got through our five years um, i'm really excited on uh, the next five years and what the future has for our hatch duo thanks for watching please subscribe if you haven't already let us hatch awesome happy five year anniversary hatch duo to many more years of innovation and success hey john and mike uh congratulations on five years uh wanted to say it's been amazing uh, I've had an outstanding time uh, working with you guys uh, and helping to create this company. Um, really appreciate that you've created a place where we can be truly innovative, not just in product design and development, but who can design, where we design, how we design, <laughs> uh, and, and we're just keeping going, right? So um, really excellent. Thanks, guys. Hi, John. Hi, Mike. Huge congratulations on the anniversary. Can't believe how far Hatch Duo has grown in just the last couple of years. And I so look forward to how much more we will be doing together in the many years to come. Again, congratulations. Hi, John and Mike. Congratulations on Hatch Duo's fifth anniversary. I'm proud to be here with you as we continue to hatch awesome projects. I can't wait to see what the future holds for all of us. Congratulations again. Hey guys. Just wanted to say congrats on five years of being in business. That's uh, quite, quite an accomplishment and I'm super proud of you and super proud to be a part of the team. Here's to uh, five more. Hello, John and Mike. Happy Hatch Duo five years anniversary. I'm really glad to be able to join this team at the fourth year and really, really excited for another great year. Thanks for all the teaching here at Hatch Duo and let's hatch awesome happy birthday hatch duo what an amazing accomplishment to make it to five years big congratulations to the entire team especially john and mike for getting us this far I'm really grateful to be part of such an amazing team and here's to five more let's hatch awesome